a very good welcome to everybody to another Friday Drinks show on, uh, well, it's almost a week before spring, but I believe it's spring. And uh, we do have a special guest all the way from America. We feel so honored to have you yeah, Maud. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a long time coming. I mean, we've lived through your life uh, vicariously uh, since you were 14. I think that's when you, I, I, I remember your face uh, on uh, Sunday Mail, Mac, I think it was a Sunday Mail, right? A face, first page of Sunday Mail. And, uh, you know, so the memory I have of you mm -hmm. is as a 14-year-old kid. So seeing you all grown up, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, well, it is an honor to be here. I've watched a couple of um, episodes. Um, if you guys like uh, doing your drinks and I've always wondered like if you actually would be drinking which is, <laughs> <laughs> which is something that I already have an answer to uh, but yeah I think a lot of people have that view like a lot of people are like you know they see me in certain places like wait are you not too young to be in this I'm like wait I'm 26 like I don't think I'm, <laughs> like, to everyone they still think I'm like that 14 year old 14 year old yeah, yeah. well that's how you enter the scene and um We'll always look at you and think of you as a 14-year-old. But we're quite happy to have you here. And we want to hear more of your story. And, I mean, now you're flying all the way from the U.S., coming back home to Zoom. Yeah. Um, well, my story, I don't even know how to tell it. Well, before we do that. Yeah. Eh, Shumba. Dima Shika. Yeah, well. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> know, <laughs> I, you know, I, in our little group, I asked the producer, you know, what our guests will be drinking. And, you know, the producer being a teetotaler and very much a uh, philistine when it comes to alcohol, says, look, she, she drinks cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, my gosh, uh, I'm not actually, you know, all that great with uh, cocktails. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a whiskey guy. I, so I, I thought, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to do a whiskey cocktail, like a, a, a rusty nail? Mm -hmm. or a, a whiskey sour and then i thought but well you know what <clears throat> i have no idea what your alcohol tolerance is like <laughs> i wouldn't want to put you under you know and do pressure uh -huh. so let's do something you know since we're going into spring according to Shinashe, i just think zimbabwe has winter and summer the end but That's and, very <laughs> that is very but, true no you know, winter or spring uh, no, no but uh, look at, you look know he thinks look at the trees he thinks that's a good sign he thinks I think the he thinks about spring. Is true of that. So I thought, you know, this, this, this is a popular Italian cocktail that they have in summer over there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's made with a, a liquor called Campari. Mm -hmm. And they add a bit of uh, Italian sparkling wine or Prosecco here. Mm -hmm. And uh, they thing. usually uh, water it a bit down with sparkling water. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, some orange and ice and we're good to go. Okay. Um, so that's what we are going to be having in our little corner. If I can actually open it. Okay. Um I don't know what's going on over there. He's trying to compete with us, but with without without the special sauce. Well, going can with I water down mine with still water. Yeah, yeah, you can use still water. Thank uh, you. I'm, I'm actually going to make I'm not a, okay. a Malawi shanti. I mean, I haven't had this in since we were in Victoria Falls, right? Oh, so yeah, it's yeah. Friday cocktails today. Let's make it yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, well, so. he's 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 is a mocktail. He's trying, you know, yeah, because there isn't anything interesting in it. It's still okay. Uh, for the right. sake of the okay. there's a, I, you, okay. you Bitters, I think it's enough your, alcohol your for you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, maybe to actually start off, mm -hmm. could you just tell us a bit about your story? Because it's a fascinating story. Thank you. Um, I probably don't know when to start because whenever I'm like, tell us your story, there's like the one minute, 30 second version. And then there's the, the we, we, yeah, all, we, we have all afternoon. All afternoon. And then all evening. All evening. evening. We, 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 whatever we, and our know, audience long it takes. Uh, would, would love a, uh, a recap with all the juicy bits. Okay. Um, so um, I was born in Gokwe. Uh, 1997, that's when I was born. Um, started school in Gokwe, grade one, when I was about six years old like everybody. Um, then I moved to Handis Road, which is um, which is a resettlement area between Kwekwe and Gweru. Uh, that's where I started off grade two. So um, 
they transferred me from Gokwe to Conmara Prison School. So there's a school called Conmara Prison School. And on the first day of school, I actually figured out that it was quite far away from home. Mm. Like, we kept walking and walking before we got to that school. Um, so when, when we were at the gate, I asked um, my guidance at the time, I'm like, what if we get there and you say that I'm actually grade two, not grade one? Because I didn't want I didn't want to walk for seven years. So mm. I was like, how do I make this peer that I have to do this walking thing less? So I got mm. there. They asked me, like, what grade are you? I said I was in grade two. And the teacher, was, so at that time, I was very, very tiny. I started not being not tiny, like, way later in life. But um, I was very tiny. So the teacher, the teacher actually did not believe me. I remember her name was Mrs. Mutopa. Was, she was like, no, there's no way you're grade two. Um, then she asked one of my brothers who was at that school, mm-hmm. like, wherever she was, I got a grade one now. Mm-hmm. And then my brother said, well, I got a grade one. So I went back. I went back to grade one. Um, then the following year, the villagers, because this is a resettlement area, so there isn't much infrastructure there. Um, the villagers then took over a farmhouse and they made it into a school. Mm-hmm. Um... And the farmhouse was taken by the powers that be the mm-hmm. actual house. Uh, so we were given where the farmer was, used to keep his like poultry. And mm-hmm. it was like these buildings with like three walls that didn't have the like, fourth hall and everything. And we only had enough for, the government gave us three teachers. Mm-hmm. So it was like grade one and two in one class, three, four, five were in another class, five, uh, six or seven were in another class. So I was grade two. And then my younger brother, who is two years younger than me, uh, they asked him to come to school because I think there was like a required number of students that they needed for them to be called like a composite school, whatever whatever the actual word is used for those kind of schools. So my brother, who was not supposed to go to school that year, actually went to school. And then because he was grade one and I was grade two, we were literally in the same class. And the agenda wars that happened in my, uh, like in my family, like men thinking that they are all that. So... My brother would come back home and be like, you know, the teacher asked this mom, this she didn't even know. I knew it. <laughs> so I hated being in the same class with him. So fast forward the following year, um, I was now grade three, which means I moved into another class. Yeah. So um, mid-year, um, when I was grade three, I then got a paper for grade four, a test paper for grade four. Fortunately, it was a math paper. I'm naturally good with numbers. So um, I totalized that paper. So the following term, instead of writing exams of grade threes, I asked to write exams of grade fives because we were literally in the same classroom, yeah. right? Mm. Although we're learning like different things. So the teacher would come, teach grade threes, give you work, teach grade fours, give you... That's how Muku knew whatever was happening in my, in my side of class when I was in grade two. So then I was, I asked to write exams of grade fives. Then I was the first in, in grade five. Like I, I was the best performer in grade five. So the following year, I was supposed to go to grade four Mm-hmm. instead of, um, yeah, I was supposed to go to grade four, but because I was number one in grade five, I asked to go to grade six. Yeah, which um, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because that, that made, made, made sense, right? But like the teachers at the time, bless their heart, they kept saying school is not really about like what you can do. It's also about like the social aspect, being around your age mates, growing together, learning other skills that are not just like academic skills. Mm-hmm. So they wanted me to stay in that classroom. Okay. But the problem is my brother was coming into that classroom. Yeah. <laughs> and I did not want that. So I remember I made a fast. Like I had a scene. I refused to go into classroom. I wasn't like literally sitting in the middle of the school until the headmaster allowed me to go through. Then I did my grade six um, at that time. So we do not have a lot of students. So there was actually no grade six class, uh, no grade seven class in, uh, during that year. Um, when I then went to grade seven, there was just like four of us. Okay. Uh, so um, I did my grade <laughs> seven. At that time, we were, we were writing four subjects. It wasn't like five or seven or whatever it is. All like right. Those days. Okay. Um, I had four units, mm-hmm. um, and then I was supposed to go to which four. I think for the purpose of the audience, four units is that's the best. Yes, that's possible that result. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. At yeah. The so time. The, yeah. yeah. So the best was like. So it's like for grade seven, one is like the best, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. for four subjects, then that was like four units. Um, then I was supposed to then go to high school. But remember, this is like a resettlement area. There was no high school at that mm-hmm. time. Um, I was told I had a scholarship to go to some school. Um, but my family did not. I don't I don't even know what happened at that time. Because I remember people bought me like a trunk and everything. And I was supposed to go to boarding school that year. 
but somehow I ended up not going. But there was no high school in the area that was staying. Mm -hmm. So that meant like that was the end of my uh, my academic journey. Uh, but then my brother at the time then said, you know what, why don't we take you to Kwekwe for you to go do your high school there? Mm -hmm. um, so it would be, I think it's like 50 cents from Handers Road to Kwekwe because it's like Handers Road is equidistant from Gwere and Kwekwe. So you can okay. literally go to either town. Um, but then I went there. Uh, to this other school, it was called uh, Pumelelo Bunero College in uh, in Kwe Kwe. When I got there, I knew there was no way we we're going to sustain those 50 cents to town every day, 50 cents back home, dollar. My family were like vendors, we would go and get fish, cool, curry, cool, binga, and so uh, main road, so that would take us all by road mm -hmm. and, uh, and all of that. Entrepreneurial. Uh, yes, it was entrepreneurial. <laughs> yeah. It was business. Yeah. It was business. <laughs> um, so I knew there was no way uh, my family would be able to sustain doing that for four years. So when we got to that college, they asked me like what form I was. And I said I was form two mm. uh, instead mm. of form one. Um, because a were, recurring theme, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so because there were because it was a private college, they didn't care. Like literally, mm. they did not care. They mm. just said, "Cool, you you go into form two. So I went into form two. I did it for um, about two months, and then my brother went to Bingo for fish, and they he like took like maybe two months before he came back. So I literally was just back home because mm. there was no one to give me money to go. There was no food at home. Mm. Like not to even talk about like money to go to school so i was back home um there was no re there wasn't really other options for me i mm -hmm. couldn't go to school there was no high school um people my age what were they doing uh usually when the the norm was once you're done with school once you're done with primary school um the boys would go and you know find gold like gold padding mm -hmm. Mm. And, yes, exactly. Um, along with and, and all of that, and uh, for for the girls, it was like you then get married. But then at mm. that time, I was I finished grade seven when I was ten. Like, mm. Okay, it wasn't really an option for me, so I just decided to study on my own. Um, then my when my brother came back, my family ended up moving to Gweru, uh, where I started going to this other college called Solas College. Um, when I got to that college, they asked me what 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 form I was um and I remember I just said I'm in form four and this is like literally three months after my grade seven <laughs> <laughs> so so are you no longer tiny because the reason why I you couldn't get tiny. into grade two was because you were tiny I was no. tiny but like remember these are now not public schools these are oh, private okay. colleges so for them it was more of like who can pay the the money that they want every month so it right, wasn't okay. really like a public school where they actually care about you and all of that so they were in a, but you, think, you think the public schools care about you more than the private schools <laughs> no, no 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 okay okay let me clarify let me clarify there is private schools and then there is public schools and mm. then there's private little colleges in town okay so i'm not talking about a private school Ah. Yes, I'm not talking mm. about St. John's, St. What, 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 you know, like the good schools, St. George's or whatever it is, the private schools. Mm -hmm. I am talking about the little colleges in town. Okay. So basically a small, uh, you know, um, manager owned. Yes, we're like one or two teachers ah, are like, okay. oh yeah, let's start our own little college. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It, okay. It's like so, that. so they 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 just they just uh, invoice you for tuition. They just invoice you, yeah. And even okay. the invoice is like ten dollars or something. Yeah, okay. It's not even right. like that uh, much. So it's not really a, mm. yeah, a private school per se. No, 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 no. no. Okay. No, no, no. no, 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 no I hear no. you. No, no. I only said private because it's not government owned. Because ah, I think okay. for government owned, uh, when I then went to like high school. Uh, when we get a letter of the story, they had to like, oh, we need approvals and everything. But for because them, there's rules and regulations. Yes, there's rules uh, and, and regulations. Yeah, for this one, it was like those small ones. But then for, as soon as they asked me, like, if you say you're in Form 4, uh, we're going to give you an exam. So they gave me uh, a test and then it was math. Mm -hmm. which is unfortunate for them because I'm good at numbers. Mm -hmm. So um, they were like, okay, cool. Sounds like you are Form 4. And then I just went in. Mm -hmm. Um did that for like another two months then it failed mm. um so then i was just back home so mm -hmm. i just decided to study by myself mm -hmm. so i studied by myself registered for five subjects um this was also like the time so so maybe for 
certainly for me and mm-hmm. for the audience, uh, I'm quite keen on understanding how you actually, when you say you were studying by yourself, how did you go about it? Mm-hmm. Did you have a syllabus and what would you do? Were you disciplined in the study methods? Uh, so ever since I was like nine years old, I've been waking up like at 3 a.m. every morning uh, to mm-hmm. study um, until... To the extent that even now, if I go to sleep, usually by 3 a.m. I'm up because my body is just used to that kind of routine okay. where you wake up at 3 a.m. And it was more of, it wasn't like I had a syllabus because I did not have those kind of resources. It was more like just reading. So at so home, you just get a book and yes. you go cover to cover. Yes, yes. So at home there was this book called Integrated Science Book 3, yeah, yeah. which is, uh, I think, very foundational. People do it when they're Form 3 to Form 4. Uh, there was a book called Success in Commerce. Um, there was also a book, uh, there was the Bible, and then there was New General Mathematics book three. Okay. Um, so I just went with those. Um, I just did cover to cover for those. Mm. Okay. So that. there's an interesting idea. I, I don't know if you've ever listened to this uh, Harvard psychiatrist, uh, mm-hmm. Dr. K, and he had a, a podcast mm-hmm. where he was talking about gifted kids, mm-hmm. uh, how they do very well in primary school, mm-hmm. but find it very difficult in high school and primarily uh, determined by, you know, earlier on in your in your career or in your schooling, mm-hmm. what's necessary is a high IQ, mm-hmm. so aptitude but not necessarily the the depth or the the rigor mm-hmm. in actually learning you don't you don't know how to learn and then in high school uh these kids have difficulties because while they have a high aptitude mm-hmm. they don't have the rigor and the 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 uh, a method of learning mm-hmm. they haven't learned that okay um but it sounds like you had both you had a method of learning and i'm quite keen on understanding where you where you pick that up i would i would certainly say yes to part of it because obviously i'm not a psychiatrist but um what i noticed with with me is that because in my early years so i finished grade seven when i was like 10 right mm-hmm. and then i studied by myself 11 i said for my a for my o level and then 12 i was form five age 12 and then 13 finished my um form six and then 14 i was at university um i had to do and i was also in and out of school a lot so for the for the entire for what you're supposed to do in four years i had to bunch that up right and then for form five i was also in and out of school for form five and then i only got a a sponsor for form six of which by form six most of the things are already like people have already had that foundational so i had to do a lot of catching up by myself which mm. even up to now um i see myself even when i'm at school because i'm getting my mba right mm-hmm. um i don't do well in scenarios where somebody's in front of me and trying to teach me i do well in it's written here read it and then I get it. That's my method. So your retention memory is very high. Yes. So when someone is up there, I have to consciously make effort to say, let me listen to what this person is saying. I have to consciously... What, short attention away. span or...? I'm, I'm not sure what it is, but I mm. do think I find it easier to learn things when I read them on my own. And I think it's all coming from how I got to, to do schooling in the first couple of years that I was doing schooling. So mm. I do agree to the extent that if you do schooling primary school, which is like the about seven years of it, a certain way, if you then change into like something that requires you to learn things a different way, you might struggle because that's not the method and that's not just how you learn. Mm. Yeah. So I, I, I'm curious philosophically about, uh, you know, um, because I think you've had an opportunity to reflect on your, on your story. And I think... Um, the way the education system is designed, you know, it's, uh, you know, if you actually think about it from a historical perspective, mm-hmm. it was um, the British trying to train civil servants, you know, okay. to do the same thing everywhere in the world, whether you're posted in New Zealand or South Africa or, or, or Canada. And, you know, so the modern education kind of evolved from, you know, the need for that structure, mm-hmm. which is why we say you go into grade one at this particular age mm-hmm. and your 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 cohort, um, notwithstanding differences in aptitude and conscientiousness, uh, you you generally progress 
uh, based on the calendar. Yeah. Right. So, so from grade yeah, one to grade two to grade four, yes. uh, you know, and then, and yet the the reality of the matter is, we're very different. We are in terms of our talents and uh, our, our personality traits. Some people are highly conscientious. Mm-hmm. Some people have. Um, excellent uh, or, or above average aptitude, mm-hmm. but the system doesn't actually allow for that, right? I, I mean, I, I think in Tinashe and my experience through formal education, you know, seven years of primary school and uh, six years of, of high school, it was rare, if it happened at all, for people to skip grades, mm-hmm. no matter how much they demonstrated uh, that they may, be, you know, um, that they could operate at a higher level. And it's and and it's not a it's not a bug it's a feature you're just supposed to progress. <laughs> yes. Well, know. socialization uh, part of it is because uh, while it is true that mentally you were at a particular pace, mm-hmm. but emotionally are you and socially are you or do you have that aptitude? You know, so a fourteen year old now with eighteen year old, you know, that's See, a, but but the thing is the reason why I'm asking this question is because if you mm. actually look at the real world because ultimately. The whole point of investing in education is so that when you become an adult and you are, you know, um, we let you out into the world, mm-hmm. you uh, you thrive, mm-hmm. right? You get a good job, or you you know, you learn how to build a business, or if you choose to be a doctor or, or a lawyer, you, you're able to set up your yeah. practice and and be successful, yeah. right? Yeah. And if you actually look at um, you know the world. Some of the most successful people um, have bucked the convention, you know. So you've got Zuckerberg dropping out of Harvard mm-hmm. or, or Bill Gates, and then they built businesses that have changed the world. And so when you think about these 13 years, does it make sense for us to still follow this regimented path mm. when we know that in every court there's mm-hmm. po- a potential Bill Gates or Zuckerberg who could go through the system faster? And then emerge on the, and other, emerge side on the other side and build something that changes the world. I d- I don't think I hear both sides. So I think to his point, the, um, the issue around socialization. When my teachers are saying you're in school not just for the academic part, but you're also here to like learn social skills and everything. I do think that um, there are things that you learn in school that are not books, that are not what you're going to read, like social skills, mm-hmm. um, and you know. Uh, other like I think they call them soft skills. Mm. Um, for me, when I was, even though I was academically successful, most of the time until I was until I was done with my masters, pretty much because I was done with my masters when I was twenty. Um, I really felt like I was an island. I felt like I couldn't relate with the people I was in class with because people who were who I was in class with were five Much years mm-hmm. five years older than I was, and the people that I was that were my age mates were really stressing about things that I I was done with. Like when I was at college, they were like form two um, of that. Mm. But you would consistently people who went to school with me know this. When even when I was at Sandringham, so when I was at Sandringham. We had a nice hostel, Trinity House, which was for A level girls. So this was like for form six, mm-hmm. form six girls. Mm-hmm. But you would rarely find me in Trinity. I was in the form one dorms, like those are like dorm, like proper dorms. <laughs> <laughs> that is hanging out with people <laughs> that's your age. where my age mates were, you yeah. know. But then we would still not be able to relate hundred percent because while they had curfews, I probably did not have as much as the curfew as they had. Mm-hmm. While they had like things that they needed to go through, they were even eating at a different dining hall than I was. Mm-hmm. Our dining hall was like way out of school with so much other freedoms that they didn't have. So I still wanted to be with them, but still I couldn't relate with them hundred percent. So mm-hmm. I get the I get the socialization part. Mm-hmm. I also think like the formal education system needs to stay like with some sort of standard like that, mainly because we are all different, but mm-hmm. we can't then have a, an education system that is poor or that is like tailor made for each and every one of us. That is why it's very important to like bucket people into like cohorts. You're six year you're six years old, you're gonna go into school with six year six year olds. This is the curriculum we expect you to, to learn this in seven years, you're gonna learn it in seven years. Where I do think that the education system fails is where someone is clearly doing better. Better or or gifted. Let's use the word gifted. Is is 
is more everyone is gifted <laughs> academically gifted yes uh, where somebody gifted. is operating at a level that is higher than others mm-hmm. i think it's counterproductive to continue to keep them there mm-hmm. um because um and and this is what the formal education system does and this is what the public schools what i was talking about like the rules and the regulations mm-hmm. um when i was going for four five um when i went when we went to Fupa jenna high school i remember the headmaster asking for time to get approval from the district to be able to take me in mm. even though so with the other schools this was now in chengu to the other schools were like well we don't know if it's you actually set for the form four exams oh right we don't think it's <laughs> you because how can somebody who's so young wow. but i set for my exams as an external candidate but mm. i set for them at pubajana high school so mm. they knew me like they had seen me take these exams mm-hmm. they knew that i could handle form five but still they thought they needed to get approval Even after I had my um I had 12 points at A level I went to apply for uh, accounting at at the University of Zimbabwe and I remember meeting these two ladies and they're like but it is important that I'm not cura then you can come back in four years and then you can apply and wow. then at that time um I remember they would try to put my details into the system but I think the system would be like the your age was too low yeah, yeah. so there, there was not even an option to select my date there. of birth right <laughs> <laughs> because at that time it was like mm. 1992 1993 those are the people coming to college and it was in 1997 so they were like we're going to put this aside but let's say to go home mbo no kura and then after four years you can come back and apply for whatever program you want mm. and i met that a lot mm-hmm. uh which i think is a very counterproductive way of doing things um because I think that it's more of you you're just supposed to recognize like oh this was meant to take you four years you did it in one oh great let's move you to the next one so that we continue to utilize your brain or whatever it is that we want to do instead of trying to say even though you're doing better than this we want to keep you here i think that is that does not allow so i, I want to make a counter argument to the one rufaro is making mm-hmm. uh and you're a classic example that actually the the schooling system mm-hmm. while it's great mm-hmm. uh it's actually inadequate for gifted kids that actually we don't know how to so slow learners we know how to mm-hmm. support slow issue. learners remedial classes yeah, that sort yeah. of thing uh and yet gifted kids mm-hmm. even when we bump them up yeah. uh, a grade or two we actually don't know how to support them that because is the, very true. the things that, that you're raising is the socialization that is very true yeah, that yeah. is very you true you want to speak to that yeah i i i think i think that is that is very true um because then if we have bumped you up we have recognized that you're you're bright or whatever it is um we now have to build an infrastructure around how then do we make sure that you still get what you're supposed to get from being around people your age from the, how do we then develop those socialization or that so, those social skills those soft skills you're supposed to get because just bumping someone into saying okay now you're grade 6 or now you're grade 7 i don't think is enough because i do think that to an extent i struggled because there was no one like me mm-hmm. which i don't think there's no one like me i just think like they are just not identified we don't have a system that actually catches on because for me what pushed most of my thing was that there was actually no money other than i think if there was actual money at home and i was in a class where my brother was not showing up mm-hmm. where i didn't need to study by myself i was going to see a teacher and whatever i think i would just have been following just the normal course well let's it. make light of the moment mm-hmm. uh, and help us to understand when did you actually start having a boyfriend because that will help us uh... you, you get to university <laughs> at 14 <laughs> you, you know you get to university at 14 and lots and lots of testosterone <laughs> Okay. Um what if I say I started having a boyfriend at a certain age and then somebody comes and comments like, "Hey, I was your boyfriend when you were 13." <laughs> 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 what happens? Then? As long as you're doing any <laughs> as long as you are legal, uh it's perfectly fine. Um, you know, but but it, it it will help us to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cuz yeah. like it's like your hormones cuz you know what, a 14-year-old yeah, hormones yeah. uh and thinking and you're around a lot of testosterone now. and a lot of women who are looking at uh, yeah. all these men yeah, yeah, and yeah. the socialization is about yeah, yeah. you know yeah um so 
I I think like for me it was very unconventional um going to university like when I was 14 and I think that whole journey made me have more friends who were like guys um even when I was at St. Jerome high school my friends were like boys I couldn't relate with the girls because the girls are talking about I mean four or five years 17 they've started having boyfriends they've done, they've done whatever that I was 13, I hadn't had my period. Like, I can't, like, I can't be part of these conversations. Yeah. Even when I was at college, they would be like, oh, Pony Mana, don't talk about that. You know, <laughs> you know those kind of things. Uh, so I started relating more with um, the guys. They were like, my, I, I think they were just like, we have adopted a little sister here uh, at college. Mm. So I had like great, amazing friends who were guys. Um, but um, I Are you saying they were not attracted to you? Okay, one one person asked me out when yeah. I was fourteen, and I ran away like to a speed, you know. Um, okay. And I I ran into an office building because I just wanted to be away from them. But then mm. this office building was the dean's uh, office building. The oh dean's office was in there, and uh, and when we're having our orientation at UZ. The dean had brought me up like in front of everyone, like, oh, we have a 14 year old this year. <laughs> so they knew I was very close with the dean. So they uh, thought I had actually gone to, going the to complain dean to report them. Oh my word. Yeah. So so but that's that's the socialization that we're talking about, right? Like mm. if this had if I was form two and this was also another form two, probably I was not gonna like run away. This is no kukura quite you know, this is how you yeah. you get introduced to things. But like for me it was like this man, he was probably 19, but he was like, <laughs> <laughs> this man is old, you know? <laughs> this man is old. And I was running because of just the dynamic. So, so sorry to take, uh, take you back on something that you just said that yeah. just picked my uh, my mind. Uh, you you were 13 and you still didn't have your period. I had my first period when I was in college. So this is interesting. So mentally, you were way ahead of everybody. Mm -hmm. But from... <laughs> Physiologically, <laughs> you were yeah. behind everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that contradiction on its own. Do you wanna speak to that? I, I well, I don't know whatever was causing it. Um, I knew I was supposed to be because you know what, puberty starts at twelve or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, I I just never like looked at it that way. I okay, all right. Uh, way. Maybe a, a psychologist can help us to just look at this. But mm -hmm. now. Let's go to university yeah. and what's actually happening at university and then take us through the journey to your first job because you're in the workplace and you're pretty young. Yeah. Um, so on the, on the workplace, I was pretty lucky. So um, um, I got to college when I was 14, get there. Uh, everyone, everyone around me recognizes that, you know what, this is, this is such a baby. So um, I remember the Metron for the building that I, I was living in. So I was staying in Swinton, which is a hostel at, at UZ. Um, I was given like a room when we were supposed to stay alone because I didn't want people influencing me. <laughs> <laughs> and the matron would, um, would come in like I think every day and to check in like, hey, how was today? What happened? Anything interesting? Which also made everyone stay away from me because then that oh, means, you know, like... You're isolated. You're, like your story is going to end up with the metron if you ever do something with those kids. Um, mm. At first, also, it felt like I was a zoo animal because everyone was like, oh, that's the girl, that's the girl, that's the girl. <laughs> I was like a zoo animal. Um, then even the vice chancellor was pretty invested in, in, in me, um, mm. which was pretty good. I think at, at UZ, I got a very good infrastructure that allowed me to, you know, like when you get to college, it's just so much freedom. I did not mm. have so much freedom, at least for my first degree. Okay. Um, I and what did you study? I was studying accounting. Because I remember I would go to like first year, second year, third year after after my internship, I was going to class in like short skirts and all of that. Like now I'm getting into like puberty, you know? Uh. Um, and I would get a call from the VC like, my office right now <laughs> and, then, and then you get there and then it's like i heard that you're walking around campus naked i'm like i'm not naked and then it's like no 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 that's not what a respectful girl is supposed to be like so i had an infrastructure around me that was looking okay. out like although they were trying to filter in freedom it wasn't like all at once and it was not all of like the entire route it was at such a young age when i was not doing my master's because i did my master's straight after my undergrad okay 
um i still stayed in undergrad accommodation because i was still just 18 so i was still like just like an undergrad so you said gave me like um an opportunity to stay in undergrad accommodation but i had more freedom like he was the vc would still uh professor your girl would still check in but it was not like every other day okay. or whatever he was like now we're gonna that you know what she's drawn let's start to give her so so what made you choose freedom? to be a bin counter of all the things oh my god i heard you say that the other time no counters are not bin counters uh counters are not bin counters um so i'm actually good with numbers Uh, i love working with numbers you could have been a mathematician a physicist yeah Actually, mm. bean counter? I chose to follow the money. <laughs> <laughs> I chose to follow the money. Um, so for me, I was good with numbers. Um, but then, um, as I said, my family were like vending. We, ha- we had been venting my entire life. Uh, we, Takata, I think it's a fish back. Can I just show you? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay cool. Takata, I think it's a fish along Blauai, Blauai Road. I think I could be there and stuff. And then, uh, we moved to Chiagutu. We mm. sold everything from my orange, my gomas, salt, uh, my temba, my chunks, everything. We were selling everything. Mm-hmm. And we were expected to help. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, so even when I was form five, I would be called in, you know, after school, come, because I was going to a day school, come into town and then you help. Mm-hmm. We're selling this thing then you know what the selling is not like you're in a shop and you know it was literally Muslim was a, a bucket for my bars to mm. <laughs> take us out of biscuits and yeah. I used to be so embarrassed of it like, why, why am I doing this um but then that's how rent could be paid or like anything like my school fees to be paid yeah that's how the bills were paid everything. you know that it is yeah. what it is so what my family then decided to do because they knew that that's what i would do so even if if i'm selling something and if i see somebody that knows me i would run away from the <laughs> <laughs> and i wouldn't like sell so for them to like sort of fix that they thought it would it would be helpful to make me understand the whole point so we would sit down and we would have like these numbers like oh if we go into town and we buy oranges at this amount we're going to sell at this amount and then we're going to make this much profit mm. so it used to it used to boggle my mind how if we're supposed to make so much profit how come at the end of the day we don't have food how come at the end mm. of the day you can't pay for my school fees how come at mm. the end of the day um we're like the poorest people in this community and stuff like how when we are when we're all helping in this business so i thought i would study business Mm. so i actually when i was doing my um my o level i did not do i did not write accounting at all level i actually started accounting at form five which is a level level. yeah Mm -hmm. because i was like i'm going to start something i'm going to study something that is the practical of business and my ability numbers. So it was like my mm. interest as well as my natural ability. So I thought I was going to do accounting. So I started studying accounting when I was uh, in four five. Okay. So I I want to make the point that Rufaro is making from mm-hmm. a different perspective. Okay. And again, around gift to kids. Because mm-hmm. once we've identified that we actually have uh, gift to kids mm-hmm. and we're talking about the infrastructure around it, mm-hmm. it's if a society can produce gift to kids, mm-hmm then it's it's incumbent upon the society then giving these gifted kids a pathway in which they can help society the greatest. So Mm -hmm. if it's mental aptitude, Mm -hmm. that's why he's talking about physicists Mm -hmm. and mathematics because we're saying you're so gifted that it would be a waste for you to be just like any other accountant who studied Shona, history. Uh, current problems we have. Well, that, that's not uh, the the real problem that we have, mm-hmm. right? Uh, we, we're saying that for you to be a min- minister of finance, yeah. there are millions of other Zimbabweans who are potentially capable at that particular job. Mm-hmm. But if you look at mathematics or phys- physics, they are probably 10 out of the entire population who can get to that level. Okay. You know, so you could have been that person who becomes the greatest physicist in the world Mm -hmm. because you're so gifted and if we had the right infrastructure for people Mm -hmm. who are gifted Mm -hmm. then we'll put them in positions where they are best able to help society 
certainly not been counting. <laughs> No, we're just having fun with you. <laughs> I'm thinking of a respectful way to respond to that. No, no, that's um, why we're here and that's why we it's Friday drinks. Yeah. We, um, we take jabs as much as we give them. Yeah, I You don't have to be politically correct. At I, all. I I I I think for me ending in accounting was the best outcome for me. Because I do think there's also a privilege that's embedded in being able to do whatever you want to do Mm -hmm. there's a privilege that not many people have and i just don't think i for me the immediate problem was money i was solving for money and i Mm. think for in my case um that made the most sense for you at the time the most sense um would it be different if i was born to an affluent family somewhere maybe but for my case this was the best car, the best outcome. Mm. Um, and I was thinking, but then in terms of like mentorship and everything, like getting uh, the proper resources, how I even got to become a um, channel accountant mm-hmm. is to my, who uh, was a partner in Deloitte, mm. called me and said, hey, I'm a partner in Deloitte. I'm like, okay. Um, I don't, I, at that point. You like, have no idea what, I what Deloitte no, was. I, I, I knew there was something called Deloitte. Like everybody talks about Deloitte, but I wasn't mm. like very privy to what what does a channel accountant, how are they different from a normal accountant? Mm-hmm. For me at that time, uh, growing up, everyone everyone in my family actually calls me doctor because mm. everyone in my family thought I was going to be that one person. I was the first person in my family to go to university. Mm. But everyone thought I was going to be that one person who's going to have a master's and a PhD. Mm. So that's what I actually wanted to do. Okay. A master's. That's why I have a master's in accounting. Mm. I was going to have a PhD in accounting. Ah, because... Mm. From my, the community I come from, that that's is the path forward. The pathway, yeah. right? Well, sh- sh- shout out to my for, for giving <laughs> yes, for giving yes, you a call forever, at, at, at that point in time. Grateful, forever yeah. grateful, forever to my and uh, and Anesu Anesu Daka, the CAA mm. uh, founder. Um, so I do think there is an argument to be made for mentorship and you know providing that structure that says, hey, this is what you know, but this. Mm. You could There's a do whole this. lot more. There's a whole okay. world away. That's why you see when when I was still doing like my YouTube and my social media and stuff because I wanted to make people know these things because I actually didn't know about them okay. until someone called me. But it's not everybody who has the privilege of having a partner to like call you. Like it's not a privilege. That's that true. Everyone Walk through that. Uh, what actually happened at Deloitte and what was the experience? Because now you're in the working. In the working world. In the working world. Deloitte was a And people, people don't care as much about your aptitude. It's now more about your Delivery. other skills. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, Deloitte was a fantastic. I wouldn't have asked for a better place to start my my career. So I mm. did work at Zimra for my internship because I was sponsored by Zimra. So uh-huh. I did a year at Zimra. And the plan is... Is that where you started picking up uh, mini skirts? Uh, <laughs> No, blame it on puberty. Okay. Blame, blame, blame it on puberty. Because young girls were chic. Remember, it was late. Young girls were chic. Young girls were Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay. Blame that on puberty. Um, but um, cool. And also the other thing about the men's kids. When I got to use it, they gave me a mentor who was like a church girl to go help me buy clothes. <laughs> so, <laughs> 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 she wasn't really buying me what she would wear, like the long skirts and everything. But then when I came back from internship, I had my money. Remember, Zimra paid really well. I think it still does. It was like one of the like the best paying uh, companies for internship. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I had my own money, and I could go into the shop and buy my own things. So that's why I was now like wearing mm. those those mini skirts and stuff. Um, but like going back to Deloitte. So Deloitte was amazing in the in the sense that remember when I learned my articles from high school. Yep. Mm. So I was literally with my age man. Okay. Ah. So my age was not something that's special or, or different. A ah, fantastic. Or different. Mm. And even though I had a master's, you still had to start from zero. Yes, absolutely. So so, so I was um what what age was I when I joined Deloitte? I was nineteen, I think. Um, uh, I started off. You see, you have kids coming from high school. Yep. The difference would then be like, I would get promoted every six months. They would have to spend a year before because they get because promoted. they're still learning. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, but it was it was a fantastic mm. learning opportunity. Um, there are some cultural 
thing that I picked up at Deloitte that I'm not proud of, like drinking. Oh. Well, well, why? I started drinking. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. That sounds like progress in your life. <laughs> Socialization. <laughs> <laughs> um, Otherwise, you would be in the teetotalist corner with Tinashe. Well, something to blame to my. Yes, blame right? that one. Blame, blame to my. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> cheers to my. <laughs> yeah. Um, For bringing her to did. the side of the ledger. <laughs> yes, uh, but but it was uh, fantastic, and it was one of the, like the um, few times where you got in. You're not like a zoo animal, like. Yeah, people still like, oh, you know, she has a master's and everything. But mm. you're not standing out because you're young, because everyone at the firm is young. Okay. Yeah. Right. So that was that was really good. Uh and I got to to work with like amazing people. Some of them are like still my best friends up to today. Um, amazing bosses. I used to work uh to go on a client with uh Cherry Team Twazi, who is like the managing who was a managing partner before they, they now started the change. Yeah. But yeah, uh, amazing, amazing mentor. So I think Deloitte was such a blessing. I'm gotcha. grateful for that call. Oh, so, so they had better structures, you know, uh, handling young people. Yes, I think it would, would have you been say, different. Would it have been different? So you were now 20, but mm-hmm. would it have been different if you were 14 and you went straight to articles? Do you think that they had better platform to actually support you? Y- yes, because I think accounting firms are meritocracies. Like, Mm. It's not like everything else does not matter as long as you can deliver on the job. So I do think okay. in terms of being able to handle someone that does well because they have like people that are like super accelerated, even like their promotion cycles. If you mm. do well, you get super promoted, like you get accelerated from your own cohort. So I think accounting firms are meritocracies, and in that way, I think they had a better chance of like just handling. Okay. Now let's fast forward. Yeah. Uh and you decided to leave the accountancy world and yes. do an MBA. Yeah. Walk us through the thinking process there. The thinking process there. And and just for context, yeah. now you are similar to your peers. So you went to university accounting yes, and yes, then yes, Deloitte. Yes, 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 now yes, yes, your yes. peers, so you're applying or oh, you're doing your GMATs with people who are more or less your, yeah. the same so, age. Yeah, so currently I sit in a class with people that are my age. The only difference mm. is I have more working experience than they do. Yeah, but true. But we are like the same age. Okay. So um, the thinking behind, uh, behind going for an MBA was, first off, to my... Okay, this sounds like a to my marketing uh, commercial or whatever it is. Um, no, but, he's, he's a fan of the show. Okay. And he's helped the show quite a bit. But so. uh, to my, the first time I had to go to see him and have a conversation with him, he said to me, come here, I will train you and you become a chartered accountant and then I'll take you to Stanford for your MBA. Hmm. And then you will go to Wall Street. And I was like, at that point... Remember, I also didn't have exposure. Like, what is Wall Street? Like, mm. what is Stanford? But anyway, this guy seems like <clears> he knows whatever he's talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the initial introduction to like, oh, there's something called an MBA uh, that you can do after you qualify. And I remember actually two years in, he would actually follow up with me like, hey, how are we doing with the grant plan? And I'm like, I'm working on it because I, I had put it like at the back of of my mind but towards the time that i was about to qualify you start really thinking about what is going to be the next step Mm -hmm. uh of my career uh i remember i had um because when you're like auditing in the big four when you're about to qualify you start getting like headhunted with people like with audit audit firms in the uk mainly so i had like offers in the uk i remember at some point i actually had like started processing the visa but um working in audit is a very steep learning curve when you start off you're learning so much but then it gets to a point where it starts to flatten out and you start to build other skills and i felt like i was at that point number one number two with the zimbabwean economy i qualified in 2021 Mm -hmm. yeah qualified in 2021 uh the zimbabwean economy is when you're auditing, you're supposed to be aiding in, you know, something that investors are going to use for their decision making. That's the whole point. I'm right? not producing gibberish. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, like, when, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> when you're done with the financial statements, it's like, I'm 
my, myself as an auditor, I can't tell you a lot of things about these things because these numbers, <laughs> I don't know them. We applied an index, we just multiplied things and we had this hyperinflation and that adjusted numbers. So it started mm. to feel like, because what do you mean when the whole street is getting qualified opinions? Like it's yeah. useless for us to continue doing this audit. Well, it's sure. still useful. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you heard um, it straight from an accountant. Um, <laughs> it's called, um, but, what kind of, what, what, what's the expression? It's a Freudian slip. Yeah. <laughs> it's still useful to an extent. It's, 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 it's true. But like for me, from my perspective, I started to feel like I wasn't doing something that had an impact because we're just producing these numbers. Well, you were spot on. Numbers mm. that even I as an auditor, if you go like you know, when I started off 2018, uh did I start with Deloitte 2018? Yeah, I actually started 2018. Um when I started off with Deloitte, the the the, the Currency issues were not yet like currency issues. Mm. You know, you could go to a client's analyst briefing and you could like literally see, the, okay, I, I worked on something here. Mm. And then like after then, like it's like, okay, what are we even doing? Mm. But so for me, it made me, uh, and then working with like a different, uh, in, uh, different companies, I started to see that what I wanted to work in was not necessarily accounting or audit. I stopped seeing myself as a senior audit manager. I stopped seeing myself as an as an audit partner. I started to see I wanted to work in finance, like mm. finance decisions. And we don't have here we don't have much of a very active capital market. And that's what I wanted to <laughs> that's what I wanted to work on because the idea is you learn, you go out Shots there. Shots fired. <laughs> Everywhere. You probably will need to delete this. But <laughs> no, um, no, no. I, I then figured what I wanted to do was work in finance. I want to help businesses with their financing problems. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a brother who decided that he wanted to do entrepreneurship mm. with brilliant ideas. Um and he was like, I need money, mm. right? And fortunately, I was working in, uh, at that time. I loaned him money and he managed to grow his business. It's not like a huge business, but mm. for his standards at mm. the time, it changed so much mm-hmm. coming from a point of somebody, I knew him, that's why I was able to give him that money. Mm-hmm. And the money that I gave him was probably like $2,000 or something. Yeah. Um, but he managed to do a lot with that money, right? Yeah. And then we have a problem of a high unemployment rate for mm-hmm. youth. We have a couple of graduates coming out of college. The, the the economy cannot absorb them to give them jobs. But some of them have like great ideas, but they mm. are bankable. You don't have experience. You mm. don't have capital. What if we have a venture fund, a venture capital fund that is specifically targeting? Uh, entrepreneurs entrepreneurs yeah. but not the sexy entrepreneurs not mm-hmm. the people who have a proven record like oh. let's target women you know my family were vendors mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if somebody came and said i'm giving them 50 dollars and charges them 10 percent interest per month you would see even the way they their stocks bump seeker chapu chapu it changes just because they have somebody who has been willing it has to a lot inject of capital, right? Mm. So I want to work in something that has that sort of impact. And I couldn't get that through audit. That's the reason. Not everything that I was like putting no, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite curious because yeah. I think, so yeah, at the risk of revealing my age here, um, when we got into the firms, mm-hmm. uh, you know, 20 years ago, mm-hmm. yeah, the turn of the century, mm-hmm. you know, more than, more than 20 years ago, mm-hmm. um, in the early 2000s, um, some of the biggest companies in the world mm-hmm. were global banks, mm-hmm. right? And, and Wall Street was all the rage. I think they used to describe, you know, the, the celebrity CEOs, mm-hmm. uh, you know, of, of the Wall Street firms mm-hmm. as masters of the universe, right? There was just this... There was this incredible allure to mm. banking and finance. This yeah. this power, this prestige. These Hedge guys mm. <clears throat> ruled the world of business, yeah. right? And so you fast forward to where we are today, mm-hmm. right? And you think about you know the biggest, most powerful companies in the world and the personalities behind them, 
it's not guys on the east coast of the US in New York yeah. on Wall Street, right? Yeah. It's it's Silicon Valley. We talk yeah, about the, the Google yeah. guys and 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 Jeff Bezos at Amazon and yeah. uh, Zuckerberg and Musk and that sort of thing. So I'm just curious, you know, because you could probably have pivoted into uh, so you you're obviously going into finance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you could also have decided that look, you know what, the grass is greenest in Silicon Valley. And maybe that's where I should be pivoting. That's where, you know, all the celebrities that's and talent right. and mm, the, the monies. So I'm just a bit curious to, you know, as to why you would then have this view that you are more likely to have a bigger impact in the world of finance yeah. today. And and to contextualize this question, especially for the audience, you chose Wharton over Stanford. And to my head, actually advised you to go to Stanford because that's actually that's in West tandem. West that's, that's, that's on the West Exactly. Yeah, that's that's the West in tandem West. with this question. Yes. So it's a very important question for us because yes. we want to understand your thinking process. Mm -hmm. So I get that, like the Magnificent Seven, you know, the Google, the Apple, the, the taxi companies right now and, and all of that. Um, the impact I'm seeking to make is not necessarily that I own Google. I want to be the person that finances Google. So I'm not necessarily looking into um, working at Google or at Apple or any of, the, or any of those companies. And actually the long-term plan for me is, when I say long-term, I don't know, like 15 years or so, mm. is to definitely come back home and do that financing here. Okay. Um, and I feel like for me to be able to work in venture capital, so like VC, there's a lot of VC in, in the Silicon Valley. Yes. Um, there's that famous road uh, that's probably uh, as, as famous as Wall Street now. It's, it's slipping my mind, as, uh, but it'll, it'll, it'll play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and because you're not going to get away with it. That's why we, it's, it's Friday drinks. And yeah, we're going to um, catch you out on your inconsistencies. Yeah, no, 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 it's Because fine. if it's venture capital... Mm -hmm. Then it's Silicon Valley. Yeah, it's Silicon Valley. And then Valley. investment banking, it's New York. It's New York, yeah. But like, so why are you? Because you you keep talking about venture capital. Yes, yes, and yes. And why yes. why didn't you go that way and you went? Uh, so for me, New York. The, the for me, it makes sense to end your stripes in investment banking before you start venture capital. Okay. So that is the thinking, the thinking. around All right. going into finance, <clears throat> going into Wall Street, uh, and then. Coming back, like I don't think I'll do like VC in the US or anything like that. Um, my application essay, I actually talked about how I went to Wharton. I wanted Wharton for the network uh, because Wharton has people in VC, has people in PE. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, uh, one of its very uh, famous uh, alumni is uh, the uh, the Oracle of Omaha, Warren uh, Buffett. Yes, we uh, went to Wharton. <laughs> Yeah, we do have... Elon Trump. Musk also went to yeah, Wharton. Elon Musk went mm -hmm. to Wharton. Yeah. Didn't Trump also go to Wharton? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, they have... I love your sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, uh, for me, it's, it is really about... I wanted to get the network, the mm -hmm. network of Wharton. Their cur curriculum is also great. The people that are teaching in finance are not people that read about finance. It's the like people who've, who've made an obscene finance, amount of money you know, in finance. Yes, 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 yes. We even have like lecturers that literally sponsor <clears throat> people's uh, companies, like mm. they like finance people's companies. And because I wanted to go into investment banking, mm -hmm. what in sends uh, a significant amount of its class into investment banking because mm -hmm. they literally so that's bring the banks. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah they that's... bring the banks to campus for yeah, yeah. So for me, that made more sense. Uh, if I wanted to just do uh, VC, I probably would have gone to Stanford. Mm -hmm. But um, the... I, I, I like I, I like how blessed she is about it. If I wanted to just do VC. <laughs> <laughs> In, in I, fact, in fact, I think Stanford, <laughs> I think I think because I knew I wanted to go into finance, mm. it made sense to go to a finance school. Absolutely. Um, mm. it's at the time that I wanted to go into uh, Stanford. Uh, I think Stanford takes a lot of people with hard impact makers. 
which is why I love Stanford. I just think for this stage of my my career, this was, is nice. this so, is more important. Uh, because important. You, you, you know what? Uh, because you're at a top MBA school. Yeah. Um, you know your GMATs were obviously very high, and what I want us to talk. Mm-hmm. about is because we've got a lot of uh the, an audience especially uh gen z will listen to the show mm-hmm. and would love uh you know one or two things you can say about the gmat and how you actually prepared for the gmat so um i have a lot of people that actually ask me like oh did you get a tool child for gmat and all of that mm-hmm. but again i'm that person that has started by that by themselves from a very young age so mm-hmm. i did my gmat I, I did not get like a, a Twitch or anything. I did them by myself. I got um a, a package from this other company. I don't know if it's allowed to say it on the on the on the Yeah, podcast. no, no we, we the producer's not around anyway, yeah. but you can but say and, for, and, for, yeah. the, for the good of uh, yeah. our it's, audience. It's always better to, to, to apologize than to ask for permission. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for our audience, because yeah. we, we do have uh, a good audience that actually is thinking of doing an MBA yeah. and they would benefit. I, I used Magush. Okay. Uh, Magush is, um, so they have like these plans where you can do like a self-study plan. They do have videos of people explaining things, but they also have like a lot of content that you mm-hmm. can use. Um, I did that. And then I booked here in Harare, I watched um, my, mm. my exam here in Harare. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you find it very difficult or? Okay. I did not okay. have, I did not have the best gym at school. Um, okay. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's restrictively hard. You know, like how people are like, oh, this is hard. Mm. I, I think it's, it's more of like if you just give yourself, you just need to give yourself enough studying time. Okay. for it uh but it wasn't restrictively <laughs> hard to, like i'm not going to do my mba because the gym is hard okay uh because again the producer is now jumping up and down yeah. and they're telling us uh we because it's such a joy man but I, I still want us to go on uh and now let's go into some really tough subject matter cool. which is uh mbas mm-hmm. and what you know peter Thiel, elon musk has said about uh mbas that you know never employ a ceo who has an mba uh-huh. and here you are uh-huh. a gifted uh daughter of zimbabwe doing I an do. mba mm-hmm. just walk through that process where you're going against people who have made it who are saying we don't need MBAs in the C-suite. Um, look, and here you are doing an MBA. Look, I think I think that there is no one size fits all for most things now in, in, in life. Um, mm. Just you see, you see a lot of people say CEOs that are CAs are going are destroying companies, you know, but I am a CA and I don't think that is true. Um, I well, don't you have th- a certain bias in that, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think that's true. But like, um, I think... Um, just like everything in life, there's no one size fits all. Uh, first mm-hmm. off, for me, the incredible value of um, an MBA, an MBA is, especially if you go to a good school, like uh, the top schools, uh, the networking effect from there, like the people you get to meet that you're sitting in a class with, have done amazing things in their because their average uh, average work experience is five years. Mm-hmm. They have done amazing things at their workplaces. You have people with Olympic medals in your class, right? You have these people that have certain traits that you want to be. You want to be part of that community. So for me, it's the network. Uh, then for me, it's the actual value in terms of being able to restart your career. So for for example, I was here in Zimbabwe. I was a CA. Though the work that we were doing as CAs was great and we're putting in CS hardworking and all of that. I wanted to transition from that. And mm-hmm. I couldn't have done that without an MBA. I couldn't have recruited into another company straight from here into the US. So that value for that that value is great. And then just it's it's a gift of two years. So for the good the the good MBAs, I believe, um for most of them they actually have like grades non disclosure. Yeah. So what you're there to do is not to show people that look, I have A's everywhere. They are encouraging you to take classes that you actually enjoy, uh, things that you're actually curious about. And if what you actually don't want to do is academics and you want to focus on like networking or recruiting, looking for a job, that's what you focus on because you're an adult, right? And for me, what that does is it just you identify the gaps. For, for me, uh, I knew that my negotiation skills were bad. And I was, I was like, I'm going to take negotiations. 
I'm going to mm-hmm. take a class on diversity, the economics of diversity. <clears throat> I'm going to take a class. Is there an economics of diversity? Yes, there is a class. And it's amazing. Really? It, it's taught. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to get into it. <laughs> it's, taught, it's, taught, it's called the economics of diversity. And it talks about the economics of gender, the economics of race. I'll let yeah. Tinashe shut me down because if he doesn't, oh my gosh. Yeah, no, we're not going to get into that. It. We, we're not going to get into that. But yeah, um, I think there is a value in it. So, so uh, I'm interested in, because now you're on Wall Street, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm interested in just how that speaks to your personality type. Mm-hmm. So now it has less and less to do with you as a gifted kid. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the path that you are getting into, mm-hmm. less and less about you as a gifted kid mm-hmm. and more and more about you as an individual. Yes. And I right. That. Yes. Uh, and I want you to maybe speak to our audience around how you're placing yourself on Wall Street mm-hmm. and what you think is the value that you offer Wall Street and why they come into you and not the next guy or the next woman. Oh, I'm lucky they came to me. <laughs> like, honestly, um, yeah. Why? 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 What's their interest? Because um, you're just like any other gifted kids. I think. Well, if we say no, I'm one of them that wanted to be on Wall Street. Maybe they didn't want to be on Wall Street. Mm-hmm. Um. So there's that first. Um. And then there's also the issue around. I think what they are looking for is somebody who has demonstrated that. They have a certain rigor, that they are uh, committed, um, that they can handle hard situations. Mm. And, you know, like when I was saying like my introduction, there's a one minute, 30 second one and there's a 50 minute one. I had to make sure that in those one and a half minutes, I have given them enough content to think that I'm a hard worker, to think that I have grit, to think that um, I will not shy away and run away because it is it is a hard job, right? Um, mm-hmm. Are the hours still crazy? Are you guys still doing like 80 hours a week? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question, but you work hard. <laughs> okay. Um, um, but they are like, you know, like protective Saturdays and everything. So they say. Yeah. Well, actually experience those. Those ones I actually experience. Um, I guess what we're trying to get to is, again, if you're looking at our audience and somebody's yeah. thinking, oh, maybe one day I actually want to work on Wall Street. Yeah. You know, what's the what's the two, th- two or three things they really need to work on? You, you know, people who work on Wall Street are not just people coming from finance. We mm. have people coming from the... I mean, like, war veterans working on Wall Street. We have people coming from finance like me. We have people who were doing God knows what, um, Mm -hmm. who get these jobs to work on Wall Street. And the main thing is just show that within your experience, you were working hard. Mm -hmm. So hardworking. Yeah, you were working hard. Show that you do not shy away from a challenge. Show that somewhere in there, show that you are somebody that has... So you've overcome something... Uh, yes, a hurdle yes, yes. Or and they have overcome something or you have achieved things that people have people are, like you went above and beyond okay. somewhere um show that um in your experience also show that you're actually a person because i think they're looking for so a personality. personality like yeah. they're not looking for you to be like a zombie because for me i actually expected most to be like very you know straight jacket whatever mm. but that's not how it is like every day like people are working in like i suppose like, how you differentiate yourself from everybody yes 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 but i think hard work uh being um being a person who doesn't shy away from a challenge um i would also think um somebody that's showing like some level of commitment because they mm. also want like you know continuity okay. and then like things small things like <clears throat> paying attention to detail which are small mm. when you're outside, but when you're like really with them, those are like really great. And then showing that you're actually like a human being. Fantastic. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you on the spot, sure. primarily because um, you're now a representative of something greater than yourself, okay. which is uh, Gen Z. Okay. So you're right at the threshold where you are actually the representative of Gen Z, especially the Zimbabwean Gen mm. Z, right? And okay. If you've gone through this conversation, I would articulate it as somebody who is gifted. Mm-hmm. And that would encompass your talents <laughs> and mental aptitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, hardworking. Yeah. 
high in conscientiousness or actually you know ambitious mm -hmm. right and these are things that we haven't seen in the previous generations if you look at the baby boomers and you look at uh the millennials okay. they were not gifted hardworking, uh overcome uh adversity which you have okay. you know uh from parents who were or family that was vending mm -hmm. to wall street yeah that in itself is a very inspiring story okay. right Thank so you. you're now representative of what we can look forward to in the future as Gen Z, the Zimbabwean Gen Z. Oh, so, thank you. So, well, that's the easy part, yeah, right? Yeah, that's why I'm smiling. When, when I'm doing that, when I'm doing that is because... It's priming for um, something. Yeah. Okay, let's hear it. Um, how then do you view yourself and your contribution to Zimbabwe and the Zimbabwean state? Because as it is, uh, it's... It, the, the, there's something fundamentally wrong in Zimbabwe and it's not going to get any better. If you look at the economic statistics, it looks like Mozambique will do phenomenally better than us. Yeah. And here we are exporting the brightest mm -hmm. into the world and they're abandoning their country. Hmm. I wouldn't say we're abandoning the country. Mm -hmm. um, so I I was chairing the Zimbabwe Youth Council before I left. Okay. Uh, I had to resign from that because you can't do that from, you can't chair a post at a board from out of the country. I was chairing the Zimbabwe Youth Council. I was sitting on the Portros board uh, as well, um, which I thought was my contribution to the country. Um, I do, however, think that there is, I have- I've Don't worry been, about them. Okay. <laughs> I do, however, think like I have, I have more, more to give. I just didn't have the skills or the network that I need to give what I need to give. As I said, like I, I, I want to work in capital markets, and mm. um, I feel like I do not have the skill or the network that I needed to do that. That's why I left, mm. and I think that is probably the story. Not for the majority. It's a bottle of whiskey, my guy. Yeah. What's happening with our producer? <laughs> anyway, don't worry, carry on. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I don't I don't think that's a story for the majority of the people that are leaving the country because I mean a lot of people are leaving the country. Well he did kind of say tongue in cheek that you're abandoning us, but I, I <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um I think when you when you go out of the country, you get to learn like look at even like Minister Mutilinia works a lot out of the country, came back. Um, and I think we have a lot of people like that who work in the out there because they, there's just like there are just things that are out there that mm. we don't have. Well, the question is, there's this heavy burden on you and you again because you're now a symbol, okay, right yeah. of Gen Z people that we've educated, yeah, that are doing phenomenally well, yeah, uh, but now are contributing to the U.S. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I do know. think. I, I don't think there is a way where we can get to contribute actually in the ways that we want to contribute in Zimbabwe without having... To so that's part that. of the journey. Yeah, I do think... For me, I believe so much in any new stripes. Uh, okay. It's, for me, it's, it's incredibly hard to be out of the country because I'm very close with my family. I like being being with them. I like hanging out with them. That's so why you see me... I was here in December. I will be here in December okay. because I like being home. Then there's no feeling that beats being home. Mm. But we Phenomenal. have to end the stripes because yeah. what I need to learn for me to contribute to this country, for me to contribute to this economy, I can't learn it here. I have to learn it there. And then yeah. no, no, fair enough. Zimbabwe is too small. Uh, so <laughs> uh, now the producer. You said is, that. Is, I didn't. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm summarizing what you're saying. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any qualms with being uh, politically incorrect. Mm. So now, work-life balance. Yeah. Uh, ha have your have your boyfriends improved over time? <laughs> now that you're on Wall Street, <laughs> and and how do you balance? You know, what's 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 life like mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S. and uh, you know what's happening with Gen Z? What what your ideas of marriage mm -hmm. or about marriage? Uh, starting a family is that a possibility is it not uh you know your ambitions where you see yourself venture capital mm -hmm. uh all this mm -hmm. just 
give us a glimpse of Gen Z as mobile Gen Z and work-life balance and how they're thinking about it. I think I don't have quite too much to say about the Zimbabwean Gen Z because I do think I'm fundamentally different. The things that mm. people really look for or people really cherish, and I'm quite different from what I cherish. So yeah. I wouldn't say I have quite a clear view on that. But I would say as a generation, maybe things around work-life balance, I, I have read that uh, this generation likes work-life balance mm. more. Uh, again, I believe in earning your stripes. If it means that I don't have balance for a couple of years, then that's okay. Um, so as long as it leads me to where I want, where I want to go. Um, then in terms of like marriage, um, I would say this generation is moving away from the prior generations that worship marriage. marriage. Okay. Um, we are moving more into a generation where it's kind of a choice you have to make, like. Do I want to get married or do I not want to get married? Which I think is amazing because mm. um, we were raised um, in, in, in an environment where you, what was the, the expectation for you was to get married. That's you know, true. For cartoons, and stuff, which I think is very dangerous. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a very dangerous way of thinking and looking at life. Um, so this generation is kind of like a very pro-choice kind of generation where if you want to get married, that's okay. If you don't, that's also okay. Um, and the, the difference between Kunok and over there is they go to that stage a couple of years ago. So right. over there in my class where we have 26 year old, if someone says they're married, everyone's like, why were you married so young? When mm. here in Zimbabwe, it's like, and I teach one I don't what <laughs> off layer? You know, like is there any, is there a problem? Okay. So I do think that is the Western picture is sort of what we're going to follow through, although we're just like trailing behind. Mm. Yeah. Maud, this was wonderful. This was great. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I would go on, but you can I see the point. Talk a lot. So. <laughs> no, 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 this was fantastic. Just, <laughs> this was fantastic. I want to sneak in one last question. Yeah, because, please, please uh, go ahead. Because you know, this is uh, you know my pitch. Uh, passion, mm -hmm. and uh, you've had um, quite a varied experience, uh, you know, in your from growing up, <laughs> primary school, going through the education system here, mm -hmm. your experiences at Deloitte, mm -hmm. the US. Yeah, yeah. So when you uh, when you think about um, you know how society should be structured philosophically, mm -hmm. you know on the spectrum of socialism on the one end mm -hmm. and free market capitalism mm -hmm. on the other hand, mm -hmm. where do you sit? I believe in free markets. Ah, fantastic. Okay. Cheers. Fantastic. Right. Cheers. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> uh, have yourself a wonderful weekend. Uh, we're going to have lots of fun tonight and um, we will have a, a great weekend. And please, Continue subscribing. I think uh, the producer will let you guys know that we're we're gonna have membership on uh, on, the, YouTube. on YouTube, uh, and we just I think the, the the producer will do a lot of the talking. But I think it'll be great for you guys to support us. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, let's see how far we can take this. Otherwise, have yourself a wonderful weekend. Cheers. Mm -hmm.